never knew anyone so keenly alive to a joke as the king was. He seemed to live only for joking. To tell a good story of the joke kind and to tell it well was the shortest road to his favor. Thus it happened that his seven ministers were all noted for their accomplishments as jokers. They all took after the king, too, in being large, courtland, oily men, as well as inimitable jokers. About the refinements, or as he called them, the ghost of wit, the king troubled himself very little. At the date of my narrative, professing jesters had not altogether gone out of fashion at court. His fool, or professional jester, was not only a fool, however. His value was trebled in the eyes of the king by the fact of his being also a dwarf and a cripple. Our king retained his fool, if only to counterbalance the heavy wisdom of the seven wise men who were his ministers. Although Hopfrog could move only with great pain and difficulty, the prodigious power which nature seemed to have bestowed upon his arms enabled him to perform many feats where trees or ropes were in question, or anything else to climb. Hopfrog and Trippetta, a young girl very little less dwarfish than himself, although of exquisite proportions and a marvellous dancer, had been carried off from their respective homes and sent as presents to the king by one of his generals. Under these circumstances, it is not to be wondered at that a close intimacy rose between the two little captives. Indeed, they soon became sworn friends. On some grand state occasion, the king determined to have a masquerade, and the talents both of Hopfrog and Trippetta were called into play. Hopfrog was so inventive in getting a pageant that nothing could be done, it seems, without his assistance. The night appointed had arrived. As for costumes and characters, many had made up their minds a week or even a month in advance, except in the case of the king and his seven ministers. As a last resort, they sent for Trippetta and Hopfrog. The monarch appeared to be in a very ill humor. He knew that Hopfrog was not fond of wine, for it excited the poor cripple almost to madness. Come here, Hopfrog. Swallow this bumper to the health of your absent friends. We want characters, characters, man, something novel. Come, drink. The wine will brighten your wits. Hopfrog endeavored to get up a jest in reply to these advances, but the effort was too much. It happened to be the poor dwarf's birthday, and the command to drink to his absent friends forced tears to his eyes. Many large, bitter drops fell into the goblet as he took it humbly from the hand of the tyrant. Ha <laughs> ha See what a glass of good wine can do! Poor fellow! The effect of the wine was not more powerful than instantaneous. He placed the goblet nervously on the table and looked round upon the company with a half-insane stare. All seemed highly amused at the success of the king's joke. Hopfrog also laughed, although feebly and somewhat vacantly. Come, come, have you nothing to suggest? Ah, I perceive you want more wine. Here, drink this. Drink, I say. The dwarf hesitated. The king grew purple with rage. The courtiers smirked. Trippetta, pale as a corpse, advanced to the monarch's seat and, falling on her knees before him, implored him to spare her friend. The tyrant regarded her for some moments in evident wonder at her audacity. He seemed quite at a loss what to do or say. At last, he pushed her violently from him and threw the contents of the brimming goblet in her face. The poor girl got up the best she could and resumed her position at the table. There was a dead silence for about half a minute, during which the falling of a leaf or of a feather might have been heard. It was interrupted by a low but harsh and protracted grating sound, which seemed to come at once from every corner of the room. <laughs> What are you making that noise for? I? I? How could it have been me? The sound appeared to come from without, observed one of the courtiers. I fancy it was the parrot at the window, wetting his bill upon his cage wires. True, replied the monarch, as if much relieved by the suggestion. 
But I could have sworn it was the gritting of this vagabond's teeth. Hereupon the dwarf laughed and displayed a set of large, powerful, and very repulsive teeth. Moreover, he allowed his perfect willingness to swallow as much wine as desired. The monarch was pacified, and Hopfrog entered at once into the plans for the masquerade. Just after your majesty had struck the girl and thrown the wine in her face, and while the parrot was making that odd noise outside the window, there came into my mind a capital diversion. Unfortunately, however, it requires a company of eight persons, and... Well, here we are! cried the king, laughing at his acute discovery of the coincidence. Eight to a fraction, I and my seven ministers. Come, what is the diversion? We call it, replied the cripple, the eight-chained orangutan, and it really is excellent sport if well enacted. We will enact it. The beauty of the game lies in the frighted occasions among the women. Capital! I will equip you as orangutans. The resemblance shall be so striking that the company of masqueraders will take you for real beasts, and of course they will be as much terrified as astonished. Oh, this is exquisite! The chains are for the purpose of increasing the confusion by their jangling. Your Majesty cannot conceive the effect produced by eight chained orangutans rushing in with savage cries among the crowd of delicately and gorgeously habited men and women. The contrast is inimitable. It must be, said the king, and the council arose hurriedly, as it was growing late, to put in execution the scheme of Hop Frog. His mode of equipping the party as orangutans was very simple, but effective enough for his purposes. The imitations made by the dwarf were sufficiently beast-like and more than sufficiently hideous. Their truthfulness to nature was thus thought to be secured. The king and his ministers were first encased in tight-fitting stockinet shirts and drawers. They were then saturated with tar, and a thick coating of flax was plastered upon the tar. A long chain was passed about the waist of the king, and then about all successively in the same manner. When this chaining arrangement was complete, they formed a circle, and Hot Frog passed the residue of the chain in two diameters, at right angles across the circle. The grand ballroom in which the masquerade was to take place was a circular room receiving the light of the sun only through a single window at top. At night, it was illuminated by a large chandelier, lowered or elevated by means of a counterbalance passed outside the cupola and over the roof. The arrangements of the room had been left to Trepetta's superintendence, but guided by her friend the dwarf. At his suggestion, the chandelier was removed. Additional sconces were set in various parts of the hall, and a flambeau was placed in the right hand of each of the caryatides that stood against the wall. The eight orangutans, taking Hop Frog's advice, waited patiently until midnight before making their appearance. No sooner had the clock ceased striking, however, than they rushed, or rather rolled in, altogether, for the impediments of their chain caused most of the party to fall, and all to stumble as they entered. The excitement among the masqueraders was prodigious, and filled the hearts of the king with glee. Many of the women swooned with a fright, and had not the king taken the precaution to exclude all weapons from the saloon, his party might soon have expiated their frolic in their blood. As it was, a general rush was made for the doors, but the king had ordered them to be locked immediately upon his entrance. While the tumult was at its height, the chain by which the chandelier ordinarily hung, and which had been drawn up on its removal, might have been seen very gradually to descend until its hooked extremity came within three feet of the floor. The king and his seven friends, having reeled about the hall in all directions, found themselves at length in its center and, of course, in immediate contact with the chain. While they were thus situated, the dwarf took hold of their own chain at the intersection of the two portions which crossed the circle, inserted the hook, and in an instant, by some unseen agency, the chandelier chain was drawn so far upward as to take the hook out of reach and drag the orangutans together face to face. The masqueraders by this time had recovered in some measure from their alarm, 
and are beginning to regard the whole matter as a well-contrived pleasantry, set up a loud shout of laughter at the predicament of the apes. Leave them to me! Now screamed Hopfrog, his shrill voice making itself easily heard through all the din. I fancy I know them. If I can only get a good look at them, I can soon tell who they are. Scrambling over the heads of the crowd, he managed to get to the wall, when, seizing a flambeau from one of the caryatides, he returned to the center of the room, leaping with the agility of a monkey upon the king's head. I shall soon find out who they are. And now, while the whole assembly, apes included, were convulsed with laughter, the jester suddenly uttered a shrill whistle when the chain flew violently up for about thirty feet, dragging with its dismayed and struggling orangutans and leaving them suspended in midair between the skylight and the floor. So thoroughly astonished was the whole company at this ascent that a dead silence ensued, broken by a low, harsh grating sound. But on the present occasion there could be no question as to whence the sound issued. It came from the fang-like teeth of the dwarf, who ground them and gnashed them as he foamed at the mouth, and glared with an expression of maniacal rage into the upturned countenances of the king and his seven companions. Aha! Aha! I begin to see who these people are now! Here, pretending to scrutinize the king more closely, he held the flambeau to the flaxen coat which enveloped him, and which instantly burst into a sheet of vivid flame. In less than half a minute the whole eight orangutans were blazing fiercely amid the shrieks of the multitude who gazed at them from below, horror-stricken, and without the power to render them the slightest assistance. At length the flames suddenly increased in virulence, forced the jester to climb higher up the chain and once more spoke. I now see distinctly what manner of people these are. They are a great king and his seven privy councillors, a king who does not scruple to strike a defenseless girl, and his seven councillors who will bet him in the outrage. As for myself, I am simply a proud the jester, and this is my last jest. The dwarf had scarcely made an end of his brief speech before the work of vengeance was complete. The eight corpses swung in their chains, a fetid, blackened, hideous, and indistinguishable mass. The cripple hurled his torch at them, clambered leisurely to the ceiling, and disappeared through the skylight. It is supposed that Trippetta had been the accomplice of her friend in his fiery revenge, and that together they effected their escape to their own country, for neither was seen again. <laughs>